I think it's been extremely um, useful. First off, um, just being able to understand genetics um, and then getting, you know, into the breeding process. So just understanding and bark results. And then one of the things that bark does is they let you uh, develop a matrix and they'll talk to you about whether you're looking for, you know, whether you're a color breeder or you're looking for any of these alleles that they test for, you can pair them and kind of get an idea or a percentage of what your theoretical approximate offspring should be. Mm-hmm. Um, from that aspect, I know um, a decent amount coming from the science background and uh, I've done a lot of a lot of work in genetics so that was extremely helpful um, moving forward to where I'm at now um, as a side business I'm potentially looking at opening a mobile kind of repro not clinic but um, testing um, I do my own progesterone test um, I do you know I I've spent thousands and thousands of hours under, a, you know, looking under a microscope. Um, my background in geology was mostly microfossil analysis. Um, so I can do my own fecals. I can do, um, you know, any of the microscope work. I kind of have a lot of that equipment um, on site and on hand that, you know, just makes things easier, um, especially with an aggressive breed dog that, is hard to transport to the vet. Um, my closest repo clinic is two hours away in Dallas. So to be able to, with as many dogs as I'm breeding, it's absolutely unfeasible to have to, um, you know, bring two high, first off transport two highly aggressive dogs that may or may not like each other. Um, then bring them into a clinic full of strange people and dogs, which they want to aggress on. Um, so being able to do all that stuff in house, being able to AI myself, all that kind of stuff that makes my life so much easier. I mean, it's more everything is geared around the dogs. Yep. So I would say it's more of a dog farm. Um, uh-huh. I mean, that doesn't sound good, but uh, it's kind of what it is. You know, every every aspect of everything I'm doing is giving the dogs a job. Um, making sure that they are working and being utilized in the fullest potential. Um, so I have, I have livestock. I have, um, well, first off, I'm on 30 acres. Um, I've got hilly, uh, deep woods. Um, when I first bought the property, it was not fenced at all. Um, so F and it wasn't cleared either. So the, my house kind of, uh, shop kennel area now is in the dead middle of the property. And, um, that's where the dogs were living. And I live off a of major highway. So that was kind of the first, um, barrier and obstacle was training the dogs to have an extreme recall, mm-hmm. um, and letting them kind of do their thing. Um, with predators. There were coyotes that would come right up to the porch. I had 400-pound hogs um, that I was shooting 20, 30 feet away from my porch. Mm -hmm. Um, And that's, you know, where the heavy brush started. So uh, first I had to clear all of that out. Um, That was a very stressful time. I had seven or eight dogs at that period of time. And... You know, they were exposed to a a very harsh environment for that level of um, kind of a financial investment and knowing that I wanted to breed. Um, They, you know, they were presented with very real threats. Um, They were run, you know, they were they were actively fending off hogs, coyotes on a nightly basis um, packs of 20, 30 coyotes. And, you know, I, I actually ran livestock guardian collars that you would see on Turkish dogs. Um, when I first moved out of here, they're basically, um, a hurricane tie that's cut in half. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's like a four inch razor sharp spike. Mm-hmm. 
Um, and as I pushed that out, I was able to cross fence um, and kind of separate my property into different areas. So now I have a dedicated kennel um, area. It's top of the hill, and that's you know where the dogs live. Dogs reside. Um, then I have a dedicated training area now. It's an agility course, um, and it's a big area. And then um, the rest of the property is broken up into different areas for livestock. Um, I'm running Watusi, which is like an African uh, cow that you see that's got the really big horns. Mm-hmm. Um, so they're – and those kind of – those, at you know – based on the season and based on, you know, their grazing, they at some point are running every area of the property. Um, I've had up to 30 uh, sheep at a time. I just sold a bunch of them and I'm starting a new herd. Um, So those are, you know, what I'm mainly raising the livestock guardians with is they're protecting sheep. And then I've got, chickens at one point in time i was breeding rabbits uh i've got turkeys ducks quail um just you know pretty much a little bit of everything i'm doing a lot of gardening gardening um mainly with exotic peppers uh very hot peppers that's (laughs) something my brother um you know is very into in um so i'll let him you know utilize a pretty large area of the property for that, um, and, you know, take them to the farmer's market and sell them there. It's an opportunity for me to bring my dogs out, and that's how I'm selling them locally and getting um, in front of my kind of local audiences. I bring them to the farmer's market with me, and they sit around. Um, Aurora, uh, she's my first Caucasian of Charka. She was heavily socialized. She's trained as a service dog, and, you know, I can I – can, bring her around she will never aggress on another dog unless it starts it and uh she's great with kids so sometimes i've got pictures where um you know there's kids at the farmer's market riding her and then um i've got a back area that's been kind of sectioned off as like a hunting area uh there's a creek that runs through there and i have that is now the only part of the property I ever see hogs, deer, or anything like that on. Um, and I've got dogs that I can run back there to run them. Sometimes I go run them on other people's property. The hogs are a big problem yeah. in Texas. Yeah. Um, very invasive, cause a lot of damage. So there's a lot of people that, you know, want them gone by any means necessary. And so having you know, hog dogs is, that's a you know, good thing to do with them. Um, that, that's mostly my paraces. What is the good and bad about boar bulls? Just a quick snapshot. Ooh, um, in terms of breeding, they've been one of the hardest dogs um, to breed. Mm-hmm. They, um, temperament, it depends on kind of what you're looking for in a dog. Most burbles do not have the strong, they, they present more of kind of your typical English, um, even Neo kind of temperament. Mm-hmm. They're more aloof. They, um, they, they present a good front. Mm-hmm. They, you know, bark, growl. Um, but when push comes to shove, especially if, you know, the person is uh, dog savvy and presses them and puts a lot of pressure on them, a lot of times they're going to crack. They're not as strong of a breed as some of these other ones. Mm -hmm. And uh, especially, you know, compared to livestock guardians, I hear people using verbals as livestock guardians, and I don't think that's – I don't, that's not what they are as a breed. Um, it's a common misconception um, with the breed. They're not livestock guardians. They're good family and estate guardians mm-hmm. at, at this time. They may have been used for that in the past. Right. Um, but even then, not so much. I mean, they're kind of to me, they're what they were, their history 
was one of the original band dogs. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, it's a mix of a ton of different breeds to get an, a desired working dog. Um, that's what a band dog is. That's And a band dog is not a type of dog or a particular breed. It's a title that comes from a dog being either man, uh, man, animal, or, yeah, man or animal aggressive, um, and being able to do a job. It's not... Uh, that's that's a commonly mis misconstrued thought. I agree. Uh, what would you uh, mix with the boar bull to uh, have a, a more desired outcome for for you, your yard, your program? Um, I'll be honest. Uh, they're one of my least favorite breeds. Okay. Uh, I'm not. They make they make money. They pay the bills. Um, they're highly desirable for people in a family situation in mm-hmm. an urban environment, which is let's face it, that's the uh, majority of consumers. Um, so that's kind of their purpose for me is they you know they make money and they let me keep doing what I really want to do. Mm-hmm. Uh, that's honest. Um, Armenian campers. Uh, so I didn't even know those existed, never heard of this breed, um, until relatively recently, um, not, not long after, you know, doing research on them. And this is after I had Caucasians and Central Asians, um, someone that I work with in the Central Asian, uh, I guess industry, if you will, um, he is from Armenia and had Armenian gampers and that was the first time I'd ever seen one. Um, you know, it had a lot of the Kangol kind of looks, but looking at the temperament, temperaments seem different, mainly in the fact that they don't wander. Um, that's one of my biggest, I guess, pet peeves is wandering livestock guardians, um, especially so, and that's a lot of, that's something that a lot of people in you know the U S seem to, um, get wrong, I guess. And a misconception about livestock guardian breeds is that, you know, they're not going to leave your property, that they're going to guard your property, that they're going to guard your livestock. And especially with great Pyrenees, Anatolians, uh, that is the most common problem, which, and they're the most common livestock guardian breeds. Um, I have lots of neighbors and then that have them and in Texas. We think, I guess call it the Texas Mastiff and it's a, Anatolian, I mean, very unofficial, but it's an Anatolian and Great Pyrenees cross. Um, and a lot of people are doing that, but they don't expect to put any time into training and they just expect to turn these dogs loose on their property, that they're going to guard the property and that they're going to guard the livestock. And that is absolutely not the case. Uh, these dogs are running all over the place, all over the county. Um, and I see it daily literally daily and um that's you know with the anatolians the kangles and i really like the look but i don't want a dog that's going to wander um so with central asians caucasians and gampers they don't wander they are extreme guardians they are so bonded to whatever they're bonded with whether it's livestock property people um they're gonna stay there that's that's their job. That's their charge. They're staying there. They're not going to move. Even if they've got a threat, they're not going to pursue the threat. They're going to run and bark mm-hmm. at it and back it down. If it runs away, they're not going to go chase it. And that's thousands of years of genetics um, with you know in these ancient breeds. It's not. It's just not in their genetics to do that. They're going to guard. Mm-hmm. And so I love the look of the gamper. But it came back to temperament and functionality, and I, you know, realistically, I've only got 30 acres. I'm on a very small piece of property. A lot of people would say that's a lot. It's not. In Texas, I'm, my neighbors, I'm bordering 1,000 acres Mm -hmm. and 150 acres, another 150 acres. So I've got a very small parcel. Uh, Go out to West Texas and, you know, there's a lot of other big ranches. If you're in Alaska, Montana, Wyoming, you know, you've got big ranches, so you can have a wandering dog that, you know, can go as far as you can see. Um, 
for me personally, I wanted something that's going to be tied to my property mm-hmm. and that isn't going to cross perimeter lines first and foremost, because it's legally like it's a lawsuit. I don't want to get sued. I want these dogs. And I, and that's one thing I haven't touched on, um, is what I'm doing for perimeter patrol and how I'm teaching the dogs to, um, basically mind my fence line. I only have four foot field fence around, um, kind of the inner area and the outer areas of my profit property, but to keep them, you know, in that area, I walk them daily along that fence line as their puppies, as they're growing up. Um, every dog, every day, they see it literally every day. And know that they're not supposed to cross that barrier. And it's just a visual barrier. It's nothing they can jump over. I've got dogs that are climbing 10 foot fences with barbed wire on the top. No problem. And they're managing to get through. If they want to get out, they will. So it's teaching them that that's not their job. That's not their purpose. Um, and then I move into tracking collars. If you look through my Instagram, I've got um, pictures. I use Dogtra um, Pathfinders, which are um, I've been introduced to them through the uh, Coonhound community and the hog dogging community. They are uh, a GPS tracking collar that lets you run 21 dogs at one time. And, um, it's all on your cell phone. You set a geo fence. Mm-hmm. So that's actually where my actual fence is. And it calls me every time or, you know, sends me an alert that dog, you know, is crossing the fence. So if you put it five feet, you know, when the dog's getting close to the fence line, you put it five feet in front of the fence line. Um, and it's got a toner and then a shock collar on it. So you know, you would tone them and you teach them this in advance before you actually expect them to listen to it. You know, that's training process. I'd have to do, that would be a whole two hour conversation just on using shot collars because it's, um, a lot of people mess that up and it's, it's the quickest way to ruin a dog. Mm -hmm. Um, but these are highly useful. You use the tone and, um, Eventually, I teach them that the tone is a recall, so they can be anywhere, and uh, the tone is a recall, but at first, I use it as a precursor warning to, um, you know, they're going to get shot, Mm -hmm. and that's only when they cross the perimeter line, and if you teach them that as puppies, as they get older, um, you know, it's heavily instilled in their behavior, Uh, but that was... That was the first thing that I reason I chose the Armenian Gamper was because it's not a wandering dog, but it had the look that I wanted, mm-hmm. um, which is kind of like that Kangle Malakli look. Very similar. Yeah. Um, they're both both hardcore livestock guardian breeds or extreme guardians. That's what I'm going to call them. Okay. All the, these three breeds, I'm going to tell you that they're extreme guardians. Okay. Um, Caucasian of Charcas, Central Asian of Charcas, and the Armenian Gampers. Um, doesn't matter what they're guarding. They're going to do it to an extreme. Um, whether, yeah, like I said, property, you know, a perimeter line, people, like a family unit um, or a single person or, you know, a flock. I wouldn't say I've, I'd see anything temperament-wise. Um, breeding-wise, their structure, um, you really have to watch their back legs. Um, they're or just our legs in general. Um, they are a much taller dog, mm-hmm. so they grow faster. Um, kind of what you're doing when they're puppies heavily influences what the outcome of your adult dog's going to look like. Um, it's everything you'd hear about, you know, raising mastiffs diet is a main concern. Um, not keeping them on concrete. You just have to be very cognizant and aware of how you're raising the dogs um, so that your environmental, you know, issues don't have an impact on um, how their bone structure, mainly in regards to their legs, turns out. Mm -hmm. It's just because they're they're tall. They're very tall. Mm -hmm. So they're the most extreme in terms of guarding. I have one that lives in my house. Um, 
you know, a lot of people are going to tell you they're not a house dog. They can't be a house dog. Well, they can be. The problem is they're going to be so aggressive and territorial at put in that small of an environment. Um, it's it's going to be like a hyper aggression. Um, they don't like anything new, whether that's give it an example. If you had um, you brought one into a family, raised as a family dog. Mm-hmm. And the dog is hyper protective or bonded very well with your kids. Um, if you ever went as a parent to discipline your kids, that dog very well might bite you. Mm-hmm. Uh, they, they have a very, very strong bond. Um, the Caucasians don't have as that, that level of bonding. Um, they're more, they're more independent and kind of stubborn. Whereas the co- or the central Asians, are more reactive and kind of needy, I guess, but it's as a result of that bond, um, they want and expect more human interaction. Um, and then they're, they're just, they're more reactive. They're, they're going to drop and flip that switch, um, much faster than some of the other dogs. Um, a lot of people see that, and think that with the Caucasians, my experience has been that is the case with the Central Asians um, in terms of reactivity. Interesting. Uh, do you have Neos on your yard? Do I have what? Neapolitans? Uh, no. I have a Neo hybrid. Um, it's a Neo English cross. And um, I don't like English Mastiffs uh that much they've become kind of i mean people call them doormats Uh um for a reason they're very sloppy and a lot of your show neos are the same way Mm -hmm. um i do like how that cane course i used to have you know it it had some excessive jaws or jaws for a cane corso a little bit wrinkly but he was pretty athletic and you know ran a lot um their old purpose is as a catch dog they were running catch dogs they could run they had height when you go back even further than that they were you know called the dogs of war um the cane corso and the neos are from the same breed they were at one point in time just the italian mastiff um and i think i believe it was around the 19 20s, 1930s, and 40s that, you know, they separated out into two different breeds. Um, I like these old, prior to that being a distinction, you see old pictures from like the 1920s. These dogs are very tall. Um, they don't have excessive wrinkles. They're not fat. They are fit, very working, capable dogs. Um, I love that dog. And that idea of the dog, um, it's kind of what drew me to this uh, hybrid. And I saw, I like the size. Um, I used to be much more into having a large dog. So uh, size and height were important. Now I've, I kind of have seen that there's um, there's a lot of flaws to having an extreme dog in either height or weight. Um, and I, I try to avoid that and stay away from it. Yeah, for sure. I have paraces. Um, one in particular I got, um, out of Louisiana from kind of controversial lines, um, that they only use them for hog hunting and it's, I can absolutely see the genetics with him. Um, he has zero human aggression, which is needed. Um, when you're doing that, especially with the way they're doing it, they, they guide hunts. So they take these dogs out at night with strangers into the woods and they, you know, run what's called a bay dog and a catch dog. Mm-hmm. Um, my two bay dogs, one's a coonhound and one's a black mouth cur. And what they do is they find the scent and track hogs. They'll run them down and then they'll turn, basically turn the hog in circles, um, and keep it from moving while barking and aggressing but never actually latching on they have to avoid the tusk they're much smaller dogs they can 
you know, go much faster and have more endurance. And their job is to keep, basically keep the hog occupied till um, a catch dog can come in. The catch dogs can grab um, the hog by the back of the head or the ear, depending on how big it is. Some of these hogs are 500 pounds, um, easy in Texas. They have six inch cutters. You know, they can, they can do some serious damage to a dog. Um, it's not for the faint of heart. And, uh, you know, people that are doing it regularly lose a couple dogs a year. Mm-hmm. Um, so, um, my male prey, so he's absolutely excellent at that. Um, and you, as I was saying with the genetics, you know, he isn't human aggressive. So if the hogs, if, if for whatever reason they get circled back around, you don't have to worry about your dog coming and biting the stranger that is paying you to hunt, you know, to hunt with you. Um, because they don't, they just don't have the human aggression. Um, that is not the way a lot of races are. My female is from personal protection lines and, you know, I'm training her differently to be not, I wouldn't say people aggressive, but more of a prey drive towards um, sleeves or toys versus prey drive towards animals. Um, So, yeah, that's uh, kind of what I'm doing with the hog dogs. And, and, um, uh, also, also, I've got I do have a I do have one of those hybrids, um, quote unquote, the molasses. My main female. Uh, I started her very young in tons of prey drive work that was mainly geared to, towards personal protection. Um, I wanted to see, you know, I was raising her to bite sleeves, bite people, bite suits, and um, one thing that I for sure noticed. Um, is that if you run a dog on a hog and it's a prey driven dog that you were teaching to do personal protection, they very quickly lose interest in, um, a fake scenario because there is no way you can, um, you know, bring about that level of liveliness that you get from a squealing pig that's actually bleeding and fighting and you can't, you just can't bring that level of realism. So if you run a younger dog on a hog, um, that dog's probably going to end up being a hog dog. If you, you know, if it doesn't cur out and it, um, you know, basically meets the fight and the threat, um, and rises to that occasion, then you've got a dog that probably is going to want to do that forever. Uh, so that would probably be a caution to people, mm-hmm. you know, trying to use a personal protection dog and then running it on a hog too early. Once you have it set as a personal protection dog and it's, you know, over probably a year and a half old, you've got a very good foundation in that, then you can do it and they can kind of dual purpose. Mm-hmm. But both of them are a high prey driven activity. They're both pretty intense. Uh, the curves of female um she's a she's a handful um i started i put her in a hog in a in a pen in like a bay pen mm-hmm. um with a 100 pound hog when she was 12 weeks old yeah um that was i had i had a a cable attached to it i had it snared with a cable on its leg which is what i used to drag it in there with mm-hmm. um and it had already been stabbed um and you know that was her first introduction to a hog and you know she took to it immediately um she's a little bit on the aggressive side which may end up getting her killed um so that's not what you want to see in a bay dog you want them only to bark she she gets a little up close and personal the hound is much better about staying back and you know baying Mm-hmm. Um, which is what hound dogs are good at that and, you know, tracking and scent work. Um, I haven't seen very many Tosas. Mm-hmm. I haven't seen very many bully cutters. Yeah. Um, I don't 
don't really like the look of the bully cutters and I don't like their temperament as they're being used for dog fighting more and more. Um, I have so many dogs. I have, I don't like dog aggression. I like animal aggression and, um, prior to them being, you know, used for dog fighting in the last five to 10 years and that becoming like a big money maker in Pakistan and India. Um, if I could get old lines that were prior to that, that would be very interesting to me. Um, just to kind of see how they turn out and, um, check out the temperament. Um, same with Tosas. I've actually, I've got, I've seen some Tosas. I've never seen a bully cut. I've never even seen one in person. Um, so that I don't necessarily know that I want one, but I would like more time and experience with them. I've seen a couple Tosas and they were let downs from everything that I've read about and studied with them. Um, so I would be interested to get, um, you know, see, see one that's, um, from, I guess, more working lines that hasn't been watered down as, a you know, just typical what we do in America towards like a lot of the working dog breeds is, you know, it gets, and I guess not just America, but they get, they get more into show and, uh, breed registries and then the dogs become more watered down. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. But if you were to get a small dog, what, what kind of small dog would you get? I mean, I guess that kind of depends on defined small. Um, I mean, a small dog to me is like my coon hounds and curs there <laughs> in the 60 pound range. That's okay. pretty small. Okay. Let, let me, um, let, let me clarify it. Let me clarify it. Uh, let's go 25 pounds or under. Um, I've had Jack Russell Terriers that I used as squirrel dogs mm-hmm. and rat hunters, uh, barn hunting type dogs. Uh-huh. Um, I love them. I love, I've seen some really high drive, uh, little ones, um, that, that, you know, were pretty awesome. Um, so I, I've had those, I like them. Um, generally though, it's really hard to keep small dogs because even if one of these big dogs were to step on it accidentally, you know, it's going to crush it. Mm -hmm. Um, so yeah, it's just not as, not as feasible. Anything, uh, what I tell people is that, um, you know, that people that bring boarding trains to me, um, is that if your dog is under 40 pounds, I can't do it. Mm -hmm. It's too much of a liability. My infrastructure is also very geared towards a very large, you know, dog. Yeah. Um, yeah. Everything that I've got in place, my agility courses, my fencing, my uh, kennels, it's all very large dog oriented. Mm-hmm. That That is all of my working dogs now. Uh, well, especially my Aurora, my first Caucasian of Charka, Mika, my first Central Asian of Charka, and Rogue, my first uh, Mastiff hybrid, all three of them uh, kind of go a lot of times together. But, you know, I always have one of them in the car with me. They are going to guard that car to the death. They're going to guard me to the death. Um, that, that is my definition of a ride or die. And so they, they're they one of them is always with me. My ideal house dog, you know, for kind of like a, a laid back environment, you know, kind of family guardian that that's rogue and she is a catch dog but she does so well in the house um she's one of my house dogs she she's a house guardian but she's extremely lovable for people um she's a she's a social star she's got to be in the middle of everything um and she has to be leaning against people has to be pet and she's your pressa uh no she's um an american molasses um is I've actually worked a lot towards getting that, um, reg- you know, getting that breed registered with Arba as an actual breed. Um, but she's a massive hybrid um, that's a sixth generation cross uh, from with English and Neos. Um, I'm very familiar with the breed as we as we talked about before. Uh, you know, like I said, I wasn't gonna 
talk too much about it. Uh, would there be, and if you want this cut out, that's fine. This is the only question I'm going to ask. If there was a third breed to introduce the dog to make it uh, more ideal for you, what would that be? Okay, so I just did a dual-sired litter that got a lot of attention. Um, one, because I'm an established breeder who says, you know, that I have these livestock guardian breeds and I've got personal protection dogs and that's, um, you know, and other working breeds and the molasses has um, been promoted as a family dog and a family guardian and kind of that doormat mentality. Um, And that's not the case. I mean, you go back not in the, distant pass and these dogs like i said were catch dogs um so you know those genetics are not that far removed um there have been problems with people buying these dogs and inexperienced dog owners uh especially inexperienced with large breed dogs or just just a strong dog um that needs to have a certain amount of you know you got to have alpha pack mentality uh, I know that's like overused and kind of a cliche, but it's absolutely true. Um, you've got a certain dominance over the dog and um, that's not being done at the right age. And, you know, it's been, been a problem. Um, I did the dual sired litter with a burble in the Caucasian of Charka. Mm-hmm. Uh, one thing that's been a major issue with the molasses is health problems um the burble nest doesn't necessarily have a great track record i have a very good male um and i'm very happy with him and structurally i don't see any faults with him so i was willing to give that a go um to basically get a better family guardian um my burbles are not very prey driven dogs um, they're very much, they do, they're great perimeter patrol guardians. They are not bite dogs. They're not attack dogs. And I would not consider them to be a strong guardian breed. Nothing like um, the Abcharkas. So I thought that would be a great, like, family guardian dog. And from what I'm seeing from the puppy that I got, I only got one uh, from the Burble. I'm very happy with her temperament and structure. And I think that that's a cross that I would do again in, in the future. Um, the Caucasian of Charka, for my personal preferences, that's a that's an extremely great dog. I love the temperament that I'm seeing out of the puppies. Um, they bring the handler, kind of the handl- handler-oriented dog that I want to see. Um, that's going to be easy to train, listen to commands, but still brings that independent, very smart, um, kind of aspect to it. The ability to make a decision on their own, um, and be a guard dog Mm -hmm. that the Ocharkas have. Um, so I kind of thought it was the best of both worlds. Um, the structure I got out of my Caucasian Ocharka male, um, I can see you know, who had more of the molasses structure and who had more of the Abcharka structure. You, they, they don't have wrinkles. They have the much longer snout. Um, they still retain a very wide head, you know, very strong bone density, but also in the back legs, you can see, um, my male has like a very specific stance that I personally like and, um, I can see that in the puppies as well. And I am very happy with that cross. Mm-hmm. But moving forward as a breed, that's not an option due to the coats and the in general temperament. Um, that's not the temperament that, you know, is supposed to be breed standard. Me personally, you know, I'm not necessarily looking to follow any of that. But if I were to do that, um, I don't know. I think I don't think there's one dog, one specific breed that's going to answer and fix all the problems. Um, I think it's going to take 
a lot of generations of dogs Mm -hmm. and a lot of different breedings. Um, And this has been done before with other dogs. The Presa was nearly on the verge of, you know, going extinct after the government wiped out. Um, I'm not 100% sure uh, that this is correct, but from what I understand, you know, the government came in, the dogs were being used for dog fighting. They were a ton of kennels. Um, the dogs were eradicated. It left five kennels. They were being inbred to a degree that um, was producing a lot of disease, genetic diseases, and deformities. Um, so then the FCI came in and allowed a certain number of outcrosses to other breeds. And that's how they brought the breed back to what now is the modern day Parasa. And um, I think think that would be done, or I think that's what needs to be done. But me personally, I think the Burble and the Parasa are probably the best dogs to outcross with to keep the breed standard. But I think size is going to have to be sacrificed. Um, you're going to have to kind of go with a smaller dog to correct health problems. Mm-hmm less extreme. Right. Ooh, Joseph, Joseph. Ooh, so I must, so I must be. Mary, Mary. Joseph, Joseph, Allah, Allah.